Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Teach Middle East podcast. I'm Lisa Grace. Today, I have with me Dan Fitzpatrick, and together we are going down the AI rabbit hole. So come with us. We're going to go as far as the rabbit hole can take us because Dan is the AI educator. And as a result of that, I need him to guide me through the maze that is AI. And obviously he's going to guide us all because we as teachers, we want to save time. We want to be efficient. We want to be effective. And Dan, in his posts on LinkedIn, which I have been following very closely, he's proposing that AI can help us do these things. And I really want him to guide us on this journey. Dan, welcome to the podcast. Lisa, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be with you. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure because guess what? You're here to help us. And we're going to be putting this out on all our socials everywhere because AI is a mystery to a lot of us. Um, and some of us are deathly afraid. But before you help us, please introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, my name is Dan Fitzpatrick. I am, as you can probably already tell from my accent, if you if you're familiar with UK accents, I'm from the northeast of England, uh, from a place called Newcastle. Um, I've got a background in high school teaching, so I I taught in high schools in County Durham. Um, and then I moved into digital strategy. So I led the, I was the director for digital strategy for a group of colleges. Uh, we had about 12,000 students and a thousand members of staff. So it was my job there to, to, to upskill staff and students with a team of about 25 that I had and also make digital connections of within industries in the area in the, in the Northeast of England, I guess like a lot of places now are, is a real hub for digital industry. Uh, because of the the growth, the, the sectors of growth that are going on within that industry. So that was my job. And as part of that job, I was really, really interested in virtual reality. So we we had a lot of funding um, that we'd got for to build out VR and AR facilities um, and kind of threw myself into that. And then as I was doing that, soon realized that the, what was coming in terms of artificial intelligence would very much um, complement virtual reality. And then kind of my my whole focus has flipped now. So I'm the VR's kind of taken a back seat, although it does very much come into to some of the things I do with with uh artificial intelligence. Uh, now because of what's happened uh with with kind of the release of Chat GPT in late November and the whole world kind of going crazy for this technology and and it and it really having a, a disrupting factor on on a lot of industries at the moment including education uh i i left my previous job and now I'm working full time in in ai so yeah i kind of i go by the ai educator online and it kind of all started for me in december there wasn't very many very many educators um tweeting or putting posts on linkedin or social media about uh, artificial intelligence in a in a positive way I'd, I'd, I'd come across a few negative comments and i thought you know what from what i know and from where this from what i know playing with the the newest versions of this technology it's got a real potential to to transform education for the for the best and we can get a bit into that because i think that that falls under a few different categories um and then so I started posting about it and started kind of leaning into it, creating resources for teachers and very quickly noticed that a lot of a lot of teachers and, and, and still very I was still very kind of conscious and still am, to be fair, that social media kind of puts you in a bubble. And like you said, Lisa, before, there's still a lot of still a lot of teachers, probably the vast majority who still never use this technology or, or know much about it. Um but started started showing those teachers who were on social media kind of how to use it, how to get the best out of it, and kind of started to build a community really. So we we started building a Facebook community where we've we've now got I think we've just passed fifteen and a half thousand members, uh, and it's teachers from all over the world sharing tips, sharing concerns, sharing guidance, asking questions. That's, that's a great community. So if anyone wants to join that, it's just you just type into Facebook if you're on there the AI classroom. And you and you'll find it um yeah and then kind of started a newsletter because i thought right we i need to get things out here to teachers and that's kind of i've been very fortunate because that's built quite a lot and and very, very lucky to, every sunday to be able to put that out and get a lot of interaction with that newsletter and also i was asked by a publisher in in the united states to to write a book 
Um, and so that was that's called the AI classroom that came out uh, at the end of March. Um, and it's it's uh, I'm still I'm still in shock that we managed to write it so fast. The whole the whole aim was kind of while while producing these resources and talking to educators around the world that they really needed a resource that they could kind of hold in their hands and be act as a bit of a guide. Um, and so it it kind of very it started off as a practical guide just how to kind of delve into into generative artificial intelligence that ChatGPT is. But then very quickly as we as it, as I came across more and more kind of pain points we started to add more and more chapters in there so there's a chapter on leadership how to how to craft a strategy and policy there's kind of a an introduction to all the different tools that are out there and um, there's frameworks and how to ask chat gpt or google bar a question uh, there's a history of the technology there's so much in it in fact it, it's nearly 400 pages altogether and i still still kind of pinch myself that we managed to get that out so fast um so yeah and then to kind of now I spend a lot of my time talking to lovely people like yourself about artificial intelligence uh, around the world and and from my computer screen in my spare bedroom so yeah that's that's kind of me at the moment yeah no it's brilliant I, and you know with with Apple coming out with their new VR headset you might be going back into AR and VR pretty soon <laughs> well I do think I think <laughs> I think we're at the very start of a real merge with between AI and, and VR. And and I've just released it. It's a free half an hour course um, on my website where I where I show people how to use. There's a great tool called uh, Blockade Labs. If you just type Blockade Labs into Google, it's a free website. You don't have to log in. So they're not they don't take any personal details or anything like that. So it's safe to use. And you essentially just write a few words in and based off your prompts, it creates a full 360 virtual reality environment. Um, and then you can add so you, then I, I show people within that course how to go to image generation tools and create their own realistic assets that they can put into that virtual world and put a headset on and you're in there so i think very much where that technology will go is and and i know some companies are working on this at the moment you will literally be to put a headset on and speak and say something like put a tree over there put a building over there create a classroom create this you'd be, you'd be literally be able to speak realities into existence within virtual reality um which is which quite excites me really and i think i think where that that real use case between um artificial intelligence paired with vr that that use case is going to be it's going to be such a crazy use case because if if vr is going to be big and i know i know there's been a lot of uh, stalls in this journey for VR, uh, especially when it comes to kind of Facebook and and Meta, Mark Zuckerberg trying to push it, um, and then kind of fading into the background a bit. There's been a lot of people talking about will VR actually become the big thing everyone thought it was going to be. I still think it will, uh, and I think it'll get there by being paired with AI because the 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 functionality is going to be cr unreal. And and I remember when I was when I was uh, leading on VR projects in my old job. Um, to create a virtual reality world, we'd pay a company about 15,000 uh, British pounds to do that. And now you, the tools are there with no technical skills to be able to, within half an hour, create something of very similar quality. Um, and it, the democratization of that creativity is just phenomenal in such a short period of time. I love how you went about, you know, your journey as the AI educator, like you saw something that was on the cusp of being, you know, the thing that will be talked about by everybody. And then you just got the handle, the AI educator, which by the way, is brilliant. <laughs> I was like, when I saw that, I was like, brilliant catch. Um, and then you really just start creating content around it. Um, one of my things that I'm known for talking about, I wrote about this in Philippa Raithmel's book, um, The Digital Strategy. It's a, I wrote a chapter in that book about why educators should create content, um, because I'm like the evangelist of that. Why do you think educators should create content? Uh, that's a good question. I was just I was you might have noticed me looking around there because I've got that book somewhere sorry my room is just full of books everywhere but it's in a pile somewhere around me ah the digital uh, so ecosystem brilliant book. yeah Austria. yeah it's uh it's great um remember i bought at the same time as al kingsley's book on on digital strategy and uh and they both really helped me in my previous job the yeah um i th i think because 
it's interesting. I've been thinking about this a lot recently, and and I think it's because artificial intelligence really kind of infringes upon human creativity. And and when I say that, I don't. I'm not making a judgment there because I think there's a lot of positives there. And I've, and I mentioned a kind of the democratization of skills or the, the doc, democratization of, of creativity which is amazing for someone like me who who is, finds it really difficult to draw or have any or be or be very creative kind of physically um so um i think and i think a lot if not all of what we do is as as humans and and forgive me i used to be a philosophy teacher so if i go too too philosophical just bring me back down to earth but sometimes i can't help it but i think sometimes I think uh, most of what we do as humans, if not all, is is based on a foundation of of creativity, um, and I think, and I think that's probably where we find happiness as 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 humans. Um, I, I know certainly I do, and 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 I suppose you can only really speak primarily from your own perspective. But a, a lot of what I do, if I if I find it difficult to be creative within that sphere. I find it a bit boring and and I think it was the same when I was a teacher as well so a big part of of me um trying to be a good teacher and and, and enjoying teaching was that I, I I really loved creating something that I could then share with with the students in front of me and so that it could really kind of try and inspire them and and and, and to help them develop deeper learning and also being in the room just being in the room with students and and kind of seeing that, um, what is it kind of like spontaneous creativity? And I used to, um, <laughs> believe it or not, but before I became a teacher, I was a stand up comedian for a couple of years. And, and I used to really enjoy kind of the just kind of sparring with an audience, kind of just, I mean, it's terrifying, but I'm just kind of doing, they call it crowd work, where, where, it, where someone from the audience might say something and you just, you try and try and get something funny out of it with them. And I really used to love doing that with students because it would kind of and and not just to be funny, but but to deeper deeper um, the understanding or to to progress the learning, because you and and it's probably we might want to return to this, but it's probably one of the downfalls of of some of this technology, is that it can produce you resources and and so on, plan lessons, but a large part of what a teacher is is reacting to the students that are in front of them. So as as I'm sure most teachers will will know that you could have you could have the perfect lesson plan, but how how often does it actually pan out that way? So, um, yeah, I think I think that that creativity is at the center of what we do, and, and it goes back to creating curriculums, creating lessons, um, creating an atmosphere within the room, and 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 make I suppose what I'm talking about is creating a a learning environment that's conducive and, and and a place where our students want to learn. So I, I think I think to go back to your, your original question, I think um being able to create content is 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 absolutely vital. Um, I, I mean I don't know about anybody else, but whenever I when I was in the classroom, it's been about a year and a half, uh, two years since I was in the classroom, but but I could I could very rarely in fact, if ever, take a, a pre-written resource or a pre-created resource and just use it as as it was. And I think it goes back to what I was saying about how actually, even if you've got, let's say you've got two year nine classes and they're both they're both very similar, if you prepared one resource for one class, you'd probably have to adapt it, whether that be pre-planned or in the moment, because it's a very different group of students who've got different needs, different abilities. Um yeah and and just a different set of human beings it's a bit like if you if you ever deliver pd sessions or talks to groups of teachers what like a talk in front of one group of teachers can be very different to a talk in front of another group of teachers because of because of the dynamics and, and what the needs are in the room so i think create being able to create content uh, whatever that might be is 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 a is a big thing for teachers i think is it's it's a, it's a huge thing it's an expression of who they are as a teacher and um uh, it's a bridge between them and the students essentially it's the professional bridge so yeah and i and i think ai has so much to offer with with creating content good i yeah i agree with you so from your perspective then um what are some of the ways because we know that ai 
helps us to do things faster. We had um, a webinar with some great people on it um, recently about harnessing the power of AI in education. And we touched on some of that. But if, if you are a teacher and you're thinking, okay, how do I use this? What is the value? How can you use AI to reduce some of the administrative burden on teachers and allow them to do what you just mentioned, which is that creative piece? Yeah, I think, first of all, you have to, I, I would start with something like ChatGPT or Google Bard. Google Bard is now completely free to, to people who use Google Workspace. If you're a school who uses Google Workspace, um, ChatGPT very, is free as well, unless you pay for the 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 plus version um just have a go at it start asking it questions and seeing what it can produce for you and if you go on and, and let's say for example if i wrote in um create me a set of questions for my biology class on plant cells for example it will create a bunch of questions however as any good teacher will will soon realize actually a lot of those questions won't be very useful because again, the technology doesn't know the students. It doesn't know what the students have previously learned. It doesn't really know how many it, little things like it didn't, you didn't ask it how many questions you wanted. It might, it can produce you 20 questions when you only wanted three questions and so on. So I think once you've had a play around with it in those initial, those initial few days or, or even that initial first five minutes, I think you're very quickly going to want to start, um, thinking about your questions to chat GPT and, and I kind of say to the teachers I work with, the quality of the the input dictates the quality of the output. And so if your input, your question or your prompt is very vague, um, you're going to get a very vague, not very good resource or answer from ChatGPT or Google Bard. Um, so you need to be specific. So one of the things I did in, in the AI Classroom book was I created this framework called the PREP framework. Um, and that is, it's an acronym and it stands for Prompt Rule Explicit Instructions and parameters and it's just a framework to have whenever you're writing a question or trying to ask an ai generator to create some content for you um prompt it so ask it your initial question so for example if we go back to the the biology plant cell questions i might say i would like you to write some questions about plant cells for my biology class now that's where a lot of people would then press enter and submit the question but actually there's a few more steps to really really hone that craft of we call it prompt crafts essentially a fancy way of saying um honing your your question skills um so the then you give it a role and, and some people feel a bit silly the first time they do this but actually if you tell the generative ai what you who you want it to be it will use that persona that role to pull on the knowledge it needs to provide a good answer for you. So for example, I might say you are a year nine biology teacher who has a, a specific um, uh, interest in plant cells um, and you have a great ability of um, explaining simple ideas, uh, complex ideas in a simple way to students, for example. Um, then you want to give it some explicit instructions. This is probably the most important bit. So it's essentially, it's a bit of a catch-all for just tell it everything you need to tell it because it can't read your mind. So just tell it. So you might want to say, right, we've been studying the cell membranes recently. We've been studying the, I don't know, I'm really testing my um, my biology skills here from school. Um, so whatever you've been learning with the students, put it in there. There might be some, um, you might have some students who have English as an additional language in your class. So tell it to produce maybe uh, a more simplified version or a resource to help with that. And then the last thing is the parameters. So it's kind of the the style. So what tone would you like it to write in? Would you like it to be professional, a familiar tone, maybe even a humorous tone, although it tries with humor. It's not always the best. Um also, how many questions do you want? Do you want it in a table format? Do you want it however you want it to to kind of the parameters to be around that text? And I just think it's a really nice um, framework. And and there's I'm, I, it overwhelms me really because I know there's, there's I get hundreds of teachers around the world getting in contact with me to tell me they're using this framework on a regular basis and it's really helped them. And not just teachers, I kind of a lot of my work is with businesses as well, um, helping businesses use this technology. And, and I give them a version of this framework, which really helps. Um, and it, you just see that the the quality 
of what you get out of it is is so much better and so and so then you can go on to create and i've got in the in the book there's a chapter called 40 prompts that you can use straight away with chat gpt and then there i, I there's this there's everything from creating those questions creating lesson plans um grading and feedback of student work there is administrative tasks like creating a risk assessment there's there's just so much you can do really anything you would kind of ask of yourself or would be asked of you you could ask chat gpt and see what it comes up with now it might not be the greatest answer you get but i mean to be honest, it's pretty impressive but it might not be the, the the thing that you need but then you you then edit it you you collaborate with it and and i and one thing i always tell uh teachers is that remember it's called chat gpt so it's not just one question one answer and then you and then you take what you're given or, or you leave it because it's not very good you can go back to it and you can ask it and you can and we we tend to call this training it. So you, you train it in what you want. And you might have you might have kind of previous questions that you've created yourself. You can actually copy and paste them in and say, do it in this style. So you're training it, you're modeling what you want. And hopefully some teachers listening to this will begin to realize actually this is kind of no different to how you would interact with a student to a certain degree. And and actually, if you look across society, there's probably no better profession than a teacher at, at learning how to prompt AI because that's our craft. It's our bread and butter, asking questions or asking certain types of questions to elicit certain types of responses from our students so that we can we can uh, get to grips with what they've learned and how they've progressed. And, it, and it's no different here. You, all those techniques that we use to ask students questions, like modeling, for example, uh, we can do that with ChatGPT. So I really think we've already got the skills. It's just kind of pivoting those skills and, and using them with artificial intelligence to get the most out of it that we we can get. And and thinking about this almost as like a, an assistant, a teaching assistant or an administrative assistant that you can use to bounce ideas off. Um, I quite regularly use it um, to, to just ask it some questions. Sometimes I'll just write something myself. And I, in fact, I wrote something yesterday and I put it into chat GP, GPT. In fact, it was my, it was my newsletter. Um, I wrote my, wrote the newsletter um, myself and then I put it into chat GPT and said, can you read this? My aims are to be impactful, to, to be succinct and so on. And can you give me some feedback? And actually out of the five bits of feedback it gave me, the first bit of feedback I used um, and it was my opening line. I didn't really fulfill on it as the as the blog went on, and I just needed to go back and 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 kind of fulfill on the promise of the opening line of the blog, um, and and it worked so well. And I think that's the key to this. So I think a lot of a lot of teachers, a lot of educational leaders, sometimes get afraid because they think, well, am I just handing all of this over to an artificial intelligence chatbot to do for me and have no control over it? I think you have to stay in control. And and another thing I say to teachers is you do the thinking and let the AI do the doing. And it I suppose a bit like having an assistant. You it's your intent, it's your it's your sentiment, it's it's what you want. I it it should always be what you want as the as the end result. But you've got some help to do it. You've got you've got this AI to help do it. And I think that's where we're currently at with this technology. Um, I think we've got a, a great a great assistant to be able to help us. And and like I said before about about using other people's content or or finding a, a resource for for example. I think the same with ChatGPT. I, I don't know about you, Lisa, but when whenever I've created something with ChatGPT, very very rarely. In fact, I don't think I've ever just copy and pasted it and used it. I've always, even though I've, even though a lot of myself and a lot of me crafting my question has gone into that output, so I, I think I do hold some ownership over it. I still then have to go and tweak it and and make it fully my own. I think, and I think that's the key to using this technology and the key to getting great resources in in a short period of time. Yeah, I don't. I, I think I'm still yet to use it to its full potential. Um, as a writer, I write a lot, I write every day. So nowadays what I'm doing is I'm putting my writing, my my writing into chat GPT and I'm asking it to critique it. Um, and I'm asking it to give me a one liner, an opening hook, things like that. And sometimes I might ask it to give me three or four opening hooks. 
and then I might choose one. And even the one I choose, I still tweak because it has to sound like me if it mm. doesn't. And then because I've been writing for so long that now my readers know my voice. And so I think they'll pick up the chat GPT. <laughs> I'm worried actually that they'll pick up the chat GPT quicker than somebody who's new to writing and are now just coming in and help using AI. They don't yet have a tone and a voice. Um, but I've been editing Teach Middle East for many, many years. Um, I speak like I do here on the pod. So now, you know, my readership and my listenership, they know what I sound like. So if I start using it, but, but like you said, it's a really good assistant. So I can use it to really help me to be more efficient. And that's what I've been doing with it. I love it though. Like I love the fact that I can chat to it. So like I was writing some stuff for schoolfinder.ae, which is a new project that I'm consulting on. And I put in there um, a prompt with, you know, and I didn't know about prep, but that's exactly how I do my prompts actually. <laughs> so um, prep sounds like a brilliant, brilliant concept. Um, and so once I put it in and it gives me something and I go through it, I give it feedback. I say, yes, but you've missed the mark on this. And I asked you to do this. Now, can you please go back? Like I'm talking to someone. That's how I talk to it. Um, is that the right way to do it? I, I think so. And it, I don't think, I know, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do it really. I think we're all just kind of discovering how to use this technology. Um, but I, th I think you're right. And I know I, I did some I've done, I've done some work with marketing agencies and, and marketing departments of companies. I think, I think I was, it was about a month ago, I was doing a session with Welsh water. So the water board in, in, in Wales and, and their marketing team. And, and we were kind of playing around with putting the blogs and the, in the PR that they put out or have previously put out, we were training the, the AI, the chat GPT in, to learn the voice of the water company. So they could learn what, what type of tweets they normally write, what type of uh, articles they write, the tone, um, how how long they are, kind of how long the sentences are that they they write. And then we and then when we trained it, then we were getting it to produce content, new content in the similar voice. And I and I know so a lot of marketing professionals who are who are leading the way with with AI at the moment, they, that's what they do. I mean, you can follow them on LinkedIn. There's so many of them. And they in fact, their prompts or their question within ChatGPT sometimes is twenty times bigger than the actual response they want, because they might just want it to write a tweet or a Facebook post, for example, for their a marketing campaign. But the the amount that they train it on, and the great thing about ChatGPT is that it saves the history. So once you've trained it in a certain voice, you can then return to it and keep getting keep using that voice. You don't have to start from scratch every time. And and I think. I think that's one of the keys of using this as a teacher is because teachers have a voice as well. I remember when I was training to be a teacher and I'm again, because of, because of my comedy background where comedy stand-up comedians also have to find their voice on stage. And I remember my, my mentor during my PGC telling me, you know, it'll take, take a year or so to find your voice and who you are in the classroom. And, and I think, and I think because of that, we do have a voice. And if we were to then start creating content or, or providing feedback that just looked computer generated, although it's, although it can do it very convincingly, I think it's I think there's something almost dare I say it, disingenuous about it, and not not in a in a malicious way, but just in a way that it might be perceived by students or by colleagues. Um, so I think actually putting the effort in and, and training it up so that it becomes your assistant and can help you help help you relay your voice. You, it, with added benefits like being more succinct, being being more precise, um, I think is 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 a really good thing. And I, I remember back in January when I first started posting about this, I posted um, a, a little tutorial on, on how, as an educational leader, you might want to use ChatGPT to draft an email to staff. And I remember somebody challenging me on on Twitter and saying, "Well, if I, I think they were a teacher in a school, and they said if if my head teacher." sent me that email and I found out it was created with AI, I I wouldn't be happy and I would find it very disingenuous. And and I remember I remember because I love being challenged on Twitter because it helps me kind of get my head around it as well and create give clarity to my thoughts. And 
and and I remember really thinking about this and and mulling it over and thinking, well, actually, if the if the intention, if if the outcome is what I would have wrote anyway, but and the intention and the the tone is how I would write, then actually, um, I don't see how it's any different to a head teacher having a a PA who would who would draft a copy for them. Or anyone who's been using Gmail for the last couple of years knows that it, it finishes off your sentences now. And it's been doing that for a while. And it learns how you write and gives suggestions of how, a bit like predictive text, I guess. And how long have we had that? Um, so I think I think this is the next kind of evolution of that, albeit a, a big step in evolution, but it's the next stage with that. And I think as long as you're true to yourself and portray through whatever content is being created, your true self... Um, as a teacher, as an educational leader, I think it, it's really powerful, and I think I think it can offer um, genuine communication and genuine um, opportunities for for learning. Yeah. So, like you just mentioned about the fact that someone on Twitter challenged you and thought it would be disingenuous of that principal to send an email that was written to ChatGPT. What are some of the biggest hurdles about you know? trying to integrate AI into the education system um, yeah. and how can we overcome them? So let's say part A first, what are some of those big hurdles and challenges in trying to put AI now into a, an already very archaic, might I add, education system? Yeah. Um, I mean, we could probably do a three hour podcast just on this question, I think, because there's, there's so many um, and and I don't, I don't mean that to be a barrier for anybody who's thinking of integrating AI. Um, I think, I think there are a lot of questions, a lot of concerns, but I think, I think we can get over them, and, and some of them we can get over very quickly. So, I think, I think one of the big concerns is the AI in the students' hands, and and very rightly so. So, we we're still learning about the impact of social media on our students, and all of a sudden now we've got a technology that that just kind of blows social media out of the water. Um, and we're, and we're very much in the wild west of this technology. Think the internet in the, in the mid nineties before Google existed, people were kind of feeling around in the dark with this technology producing things. Um, there was a lot of hype around it. We're, we're in the wild west and, and we haven't regulated it yet. So there's a lot of concerns, but there are solutions out there for that. Um, and, and, and I'll just give a little example and I'll move on. But the I, I work with some students and I was working with a student group the other day. And we were and I was able to find some tools that that were friendly for students and that students could use. And and actually we I did a full session with a few groups of students where they were creating AI art, they were talking to an AI um avatar and and the learning and the the engagement and what they were using it for was just absolutely phenomenal. So there are ways over that, and I think that will that will keep getting better. So as this technology becomes more street mainstream, there will be I think we'll see government regulation at a much faster pace than than it, how it dealt with social media. We'll also see guidelines um, and and kind of guardrails for for use. Um, and there's some great great um, resources coming out of so the U.S. government. Have, uh, education department have just brought out a quite a lengthy document um which i actually just almost for a bit of fun last week i created an ai generated documentary on youtube based on based on that document uh where it's it's ai realistic looking ai avatars talking about the document so if the prospect of reading a 40 page document um isn't really high on your agenda you could maybe stick that documentary on in the background and listen to the conversations and because it's really it's a really good document um so i think i think there's the safety concerns which i think will be ironed out eventually there's privacy concerns there as well and i think the i think there are ways around at the moment so there's this third party tools and i've got a website called ai educator.tools which is a is a is a collaborative effort to produce a repository of tools out there for educators. And you can go on there, you can search by the function. So is it an image creator? Is it a chat? Is it, is it a lesson creator? Is it a resource creator and so on? And then by the 
the pricing model as well. There's a lot of free tools out there. So if you're wanting to get started with some of the tools that are integrating this technology and, and make it more bespoke for teachers, you can you can do it that way. And a lot of them will come with their own privacy policies, which which you can access through the website as well. Um and just help you kind of help you with those security issues. So there's there's those ones. I think that's probably the biggest one. Um because safeguarding our children is obviously paramount. Um, I think this. I think probably let's go to the what I would consider the second biggest one, and I th- I think it's a bit of a red heron, and I, we can get into why, but um, I think it's the whole kind of cheating debate around this technology. So, with our students using it um, to maybe generate content for assessment or or homework, and then handing it in as their own, I think that's another concern. I think it's a genuine concern especially within the current system of our, of how we do education around the world for make out as a very broad general statement there but for the majority of of countries and, and education systems it's a, it's a challenge because because quite frankly we we let's how do i say this in a in a nice way quite Don't frankly say it in we, a nice way <laughs> just say it I think, quite frankly, we we're, we're we're out of date as a system um and we we need to be more dynamic and more creative with things like assessment and actually in the book there's a there's a part there's a few page and a table rubric of of how to take an assessment and create and turn it into um work for students that that allows the teacher to assess it and and understand the progress of the student but actually it's the student's own thoughts and own work um, so they might have prepared it with chat gpt but then if you have a conversation with them about it if you ask them to do create a presentation or do a bit of collaborative work or try to solve a real world problem or go into industry and 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 do something with that information you're very quickly going to realize if they're progressed in their knowledge of or, or in their learning of 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 what what they're they're learning so i think that i think we have to be more creative about that and i think that the the almost side effect of that will mean that they've got skills that they can use in the real world so essay writing is not really a skill they can use in the real world unless unless you edit a magazine like yourself or 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 a professional writer but but actually communication skills collaboration skills presentation skills collaboration skills and so on if we assess it through these lenses assess their progress through these lenses then not only can we gain a true understanding of their knowledge but we can also embed those skills. So I think there's 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 easily easily ways to get around that. Um, I think some of the other challenges. Um, I think there's a big big fear factor out there. The media doesn't help. So whenever there's a media story, which there seems to be one every day at the moment around this technology, it's kind of around: is this technology going to take over the world? <laughs> like that's kind of how it's framed. Um, or is it going to disrupt jobs and things like that? Um, which I think it will. I think it will, yeah. and that's a it's a concern. But um, and there's be I mean there's some predictions that two thirds of the of the jobs that we have could could disappear in the next ten years, which is a crazy st- statistic. But we're we're at the doorway right now. We're at the start line of one of the biggest technological advancements in the hum, human history, and that's that's truth. And that, where this technology could go, and and we and I've spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about how to optimize the current system. And by the way, I, I think th- when I said before about there's different different facets to this transformation, I think optimizing the current system will, won't last very long. So if we if we want to get into the kind of the more radical side of where this technology could go, um, I think that that actually the current system, the current how we educate is 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 going to have to change. Because if you I mean let's just take a logical approach if we all got access to a, a tool like chat gpt very quickly and, and this technology is going to advance so fast greg brockman who is the 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 co-founder of open ai who created chat gpt said and he said this in february he said within 12 months so let's say february 2024 we're going to look back at the technology we're using today the ai technology as quaint and antiquated and it's it's the most advanced technology we've ever used as a human race and and literally within the next 10 months we're going to look back at it as as old fashioned and that's how fast this is going to go it's going to it and and how does he know because because they're working on it they were they've already got the next models of this technology um chat 3 which is what you get if you go on the free version of 
of ChatGPT was actually created um, back in 2020. Um, and they started using it back in 2020 and then they actually cut it off in 2021. So it's actually a very, it's an old model um, that, that we're using. Very impressive, but it's an old model and they already have the future models that they're working on and they can see where this technology is going. And it's going to, it's going to advance really, really fast. And I think uh, one of the the consequences of this is that um, we can't just s- s- stop everything we're doing as as schools, colleges, universities, and have up to date professional development every time there's a new advancement, <laughs> because we're, it'll be happening quite regularly. We're not get, we'll not be able to do any other professional development. Um, so we need something needs to change, and we're very quickly going to be in a position where ChatGPT is creating the resources, creating the work because the teacher's asking it. The student is digesting the work through ChatGPT, is completing the work through ChatGPT, is handing the work in. The teacher is marking the work through ChatGPT and giving feedback to the student through ChatGPT. We literally, and this is this is happening right now. We're in a position where ChatGPT is essentially marking its own homework, and what students won't progress that way, and it's because of the. And we talk about antiquated AI models because of the antiquated educational models that we still inhabit. Um, the education system's done a, an amazing job over the last few decades of resisting disruption, while the world around has been disrupted massively. And and we've become very good at picking and choosing what new technology, for example, to 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 use as long as it upholds the current way of doing things. So, for example instead of a chalkboard, now we've got an interactive screen at the front of the classroom. Um, it's not too different. It's apart from some of the functionality. Electronic, that's it's, it. It's, it's very, and, and actually, and for some for some schools, that's the height of their digital innovation over the last few years. Um, and and act, in, in fact, and I've got personal experience of this, some schools aren't even there yet. Um, so we we very much try to optimize the current system and 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 when i say this i'm thinking of a i I was very lucky a few years ago to do a a postgraduate diploma in innovation and design thinking at mit and one of the professors um vj he he wrote a book a few years ago called the three box solution to innovation and he works with companies all over the world and he essentially says whatever whatever your business is whether that be um finance or or even education Whatever your business is, think of your organization as in three different boxes. And box one is the is the current system. It's it's the current things that are working, and it's what what's bringing you success or has brought you success in the past. And and we really try hard to optimize that current system, uh, and rightfully so. And 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 probably one of the one of the most cliche examples of this is a factory. In, and to to get from the raw materials in one door and to get out as the finished product through another door, the a factory is engineered by top engineers who are paid a lot of money to really engineer efficiency within that system. So to and 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 that kind of thinking is is prevalent in our education system at the moment. And we and we and we get phrases like every second counts, every minute counts, and and break times, especially, and I speak from an English education system point of view, where break times are shortened, lunch times are shortened, uh, so they, so more sessions can be added on. And it's all about engineering efficiency. Um, and technology sometimes is embedded to engineer efficiency. So things like Google Classroom, Teams, they they can help really, en- and, and, I'm, and by the way, I'm a massive advocate for, for some of these tools. But I think they're they're only accepted and put into schools and again a broad statement when they can uphold and 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 engineer efficiency in the current system and i think i think that's a problem because we're not a factory we're a school where and and actually and it was in my blog last week in my newsletter where i talked about our students are struggling our students are struggling with their mental health they're struggling because they're 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 being taught arbitrary curriculums that that doesn't have any meaning to them. They're struggling because they're they're told to think hard for seven hours a day, and the brain doesn't actually um, work like that. They're they're struggling because they leave school without any real meaningful skills. Sometimes, um, and I used to be a he- I used to be head of careers, and when I worked in a high school, and and I would regularly meet with employ- employers where they would literally beg the teachers in the room to to teach children skills because. 
they would get students who got straight A grades, but actually couldn't maintain eye contact and have a conversation with somebody. So there's there's a lot of ways we're failing our, our children with this with this system, all for the sake of of a good grade at the end of it. That seems to be the end point. Um, and actually, what does a good grade mean? Um, I was I was talking to a, a really well respected uh, university professor a few months ago who said actually the value of a degree really is that it gets you in the door to an interview these days. That's that's probably the value of a degree, and that's where it's that's where the value kind of stops. Um, and again, I took part in a in a panel at a at a, at a business meeting in London a few weeks ago where they were they were saying actually we don't really look at what what the grades are anymore we look at kind of what somebody's like as a person when we meet them are they able to learn new things are they able to get on with the people around them are they able to build their skills what experience have they got very rarely if ever do they actually look at the the grades and in fact grades tend to be looked at if they've got so many applications and they just need a way to filter uh which is a and, and this is what we're we're telling children to to sacrifice some of the best days of their lives for. Um, and I think I think we're in a real we're in a real kind of corner here. And to go back to the 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 three box solution, box three is actually where does the organization go to detect weak signals? So what's coming down the line that might actually disrupt the industry, disrupt the organization? Um, you could say a few years ago, if we would, if we were in box three, we might have, we might have actually um, noticed AI coming down the line. We might, and what else are we missing that could be banging on the door in six months, twelve months, eighteen months? So, and and I know this is really difficult, and it's not, it's not the classroom teachers' fault. Classroom teachers very rarely have the opportunity to look out towards the horizon through their classroom window because there's so much going on inside the building and and within inside their jobs. But we need to build capacity to 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 look towards those weak signals and start to innovate. And that and actually, nine times out of ten, they'll, those innovations will be failures because the weak signals might not might not amount to much. But actually, every now and then, one of those weak signals will become a large signal and will actually disrupt the world around us, which is what we're in at the moment. So I think the education system the box one, the how we've always done it type of traditional education is going to be massively disrupted. I don't think it can, it can't just pick and choose this time. I think it's going to be in a situation where this technology is going to bring viable alternatives. And just like any industry, I guess, um, the education system will either have to adapt or competition and irrelevance will, will, will come to it. And we're already seeing competition. We're seeing we're seeing online schools being created that are getting massive uh, venture capitalist investment, huge multi-million um, dollar investment. Uh, look at what Khan Academy is doing. Look at what Eaton X is doing in the UK because they know that this could be the direction where things are going. They're acting, they're being innovative. Um, I, I I know personally a guy who set up a school with Elon Musk in the United States, uh, Josh Darn, he's called, he set up a school called Synthesis where they are, they are investing so much money in creating learning systems, uh, online learning systems that develop uh, children's problem solving skills and communication skills and collaboration skills. And they're already getting interest. Some of their students who are like nine, eight years old are getting already getting interest from industries because they know that if they carry on in this, in that synthesis school, they're going to be some of the best problem solvers in the world. They're going to be, some of the best people that they want in their industries. So th there is another way competition is coming. And I'm not saying, I know some people will be listening going, well, online school isn't the answer. Of course it's not, but it could be part of an answer. And I very much see probably education in the next couple of decades becoming almost like a, a menu. So a, a menu of, of well, I, I maybe do this online class on a, on a Monday and meet with my international cohort for that, for that, to learn that skill. And then I go to a sports club in the afternoon, which is which is on my street. Or, or I. Th but I think I think we're going to see more of that. And and it, one of the key indicators of that, especially here in the UK, is that um, after COVID, there hasn't the uh, the amount of parents who are taking their children out of school to homeschool them is is vastly increasing. And I think it's it's um, 
it's an indication of actually parents are looking for something different, looking for for something that's going to actually serve the 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 success of their 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 children. Um, so I I, th- I think I, and I think AI is just going to help this because AI ca- because AI can and can right now actually and will only increase in its ability to do this offer purely personalized learning. Where and it's it's almost like the utopia of a, of a human teacher, isn't it? That even though you might have twenty, thirty students in front of you, you want it to be a personal experience for all of the students. But that, although we strive for that, it's impossible. It it is impossible. Um, but AI can actually help with that. Can actually provide that, um, and and be able to do that in phenomenal ways. So I think personalization. I think the ability to to get expertise, uh, world world class expertise. So that, and I know as a teacher, sometimes my students were limited by my ability, were, were limited by my knowledge as a teacher, and and we hear phrases like the expert in the room or the teacher. The teacher is the the font of knowledge, and that's become it's almost become popular language in, within some some educational philosophies over the last few years. And and I think I, when I hear that, I just think, my goodness, like the students shouldn't be inhibited by my ability and my knowledge fair enough i'm there to to assist in their learning but actually there's a whole world out there of 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 skills knowledge learning to to be had and ai can can help with bringing that to students um so i th- i think personalization i think and, I, and access to to greater knowledge and then also kind of some of those benefits that almost are that we see with the cloud technology sort of being able to access it at any time of the day being able to to access it from anywhere in the world as well. Um, I think I think we're about to go through a learning revolution. And if our schools, colleges, universities don't don't grapple with this, then we're just going to create more of a digital divide. During COVID, we we very quickly noticed that uh, the students who had access to technology and who had the skills to use technology, they. The, their learning pretty much didn't change from being in the classroom and those students who who weren't privileged i guess is, is one way to put it and didn't have access to technology and didn't have the skills uh pretty much missed out on two years worth of learning now that's a huge gap and a massive digital divide and i think ai will just exasperate that divide unless schools colleges universities actually grapple with it because let's say for example as two schools opposite each other on a on a street one school is as um embracing artificial intelligence and integrating it into what they do teaching their students what it is embedding skills of how to use it and a school across the road is just not touching it whatsoever just think of the difference in life prospects that a student from each one of those schools is going to is going to have because i've said it and i'll say it again that if i was an employer and i had a student come to me he wanted a job who had straight a skills and but didn't know how to use ai and i had a student come with c grade skills but not knew how to use ai i'm going to pick the c grade student every time because they'll grow with this technology um so yeah i think i think the education system i think so i think probably just to recap um <laughs> my um my very, view is very much that ai can optimize help us optimize the system right now through help being that assistant to create and create content and resources and so on and save us time. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a much needed thing because teachers need those. They're essential. And and the, the edu- some schools and colleges and universities are bursting at the seams because there's not enough time and the amount of um, goodwill that teachers give. So I think that's a really, really, really good thing. And that's what I dedicate most of my life to doing at the moment is helping teachers understand the ben- the short-term benefits of this technology to to give them that breathing space and help help develop learning but then also i think we we need to have a foot in box three and be and be thinking where's this technology going to go because in six months 12 months um my goodness in 10 years what's it going to look like yeah and, and if we're not ready if we're not in box three listening for those weak signals even i mean let's be honest they're strong signals <laughs> right now if we're not listening to those signals um then we're very quickly going to become irrelevant and there's going to be competition within the education system which we've never seen before and so it it, it could be a tough time it could be a, an exciting time i think it'll be an exciting time especially for those who matter the most in this process which is the students yeah 
I got a quick last question for you. This was brilliant, Dan. Wow. I, 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 I told you so, I can just keep talking and talking. So just uh, and, and I told just, you I could just keep <laughs> listening and listening. <laughs> no, but on a real, give me your top five, not chat GPT, because we know that that's the base of a lot of new plugins. Um, yes. And a lot of new startups have built themselves on the back of chat GPT. So go down into your vault and come up with five tools that educators need to look at right now that can help them. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I've, the, uh, the website AI educator.tools has got over a hundred tools on there that we kind of Give me personally, five. <laughs> <laughs> was I avoiding the question there? The, uh, so um, I think one one tool that I've actually worked on personally, I've helped the company create, which I think, I mean, obviously I worked on it, but I think is a fantastic resource is the is the five minute lesson plan by Ross McGill teacher toolkit. So anyone who knows teacher toolkit will have probably heard of the five minute lesson plan. Uh, but what we've done is uh, at Angel Solutions, we're an ed tech company in the UK. So myself, Angel Solutions and Ross McGill, the t uh, teacher toolkit have worked on an AI version of the five minute lesson plan, which you can get at five minute lesson plan .co .uk. Um, and you get two week free trial on that. And it's, um, I think one of the, one of the big pain points of some of these new AI tools is that it's just AI um, for the sake of it in a way. And, and and teachers rightfully so are going well where's the pedagogy where's the where's the 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 pedagogical knowledge behind it you can be rest assured that 13 years of pedagogical research from ross mcgill has gone into the the five minute lesson plan and we're just enhancing that with ai so it's 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 really a great tool where pedagogy is meeting ai uh, so so that yeah check that out um number two <laughs> number two uh i like i I quite like as a simple tool to use quiz gecko. So quiz gecko, essentially you can upload any document. So if you've got a, if you've got a resource that already exists, upload it and then it'll create a quiz off the back of that document for you. Um, so again, it's almost like training the AI with that document. So you're not having to write it all in, write prompts and things like that. It just learns your content and bases the questions off your content. Um, which is, which I think is, is phenomenal. Um, Three. <laughs> I I really like uh, it's called Superus. So S U P E R U S. It's a bit like ChatGPT, but what it does is with the with the answers, it presents the answers in a mind map. So it'll give you the core idea, then it'll branch out and give you the sub ideas, and then what you can do is then interact with that mind map and get it to create an image off the back of one idea or go deeper on another idea. I'm quite a visual person, so that I really like that kind of I really like that concept. Cool. Uh, what, what are we four? on now? Uh, number four. Uh, number four, if you've got a class, especially like a primary school class, and you want to delve into some cool AI with them, there's a great tool called Animated Drawings. Um, it's Sketch Meta Demo Lab, and I use this with a group of students. Get them with get them to draw a picture or find a picture on the internet um, of a person or a character, um, and then what you do is you just upload it, and it and it animates the the drawing, so you can they can turn their creations into animated drones which is pretty cool and and primary school kids absolutely love it yay number five number five it's not necessarily a teaching tool but i really really like it um it's called audio pen and essentially it's a it's a it's a note taking app that you can have on your phone and what it does is if you press the record button you can then just talk into it and so if say if you're out for a walk and you've got an idea for a blog or an idea for a for a new resource, you talk into it. And what it does is it it uses um ChatGPT technology in the background to provide a detailed summary of your so if you're like me and Write you that of, down. You, <laughs> if you're umming and ahhing a lot and and then you go back and look at a transcript of your voice notes, it's just a lot of you're gonna have to do some work to find the nugget of the good idea that you had in there what this will do is it'll get rid of all of the the um and r in and and really summarize it into a nice concise and you can train it a bit as well so you you can ask for how long you want the summary to be what tone you want the summary to be in and then what you can do is you can search your voice notes afterwards as well so if you Ooh. if you look wanting to pull them together it's it's a it's it's very early and the guy is really active on twitter and really builds in real What's time that? on twitter um, 
Oh, don't ask me that. It's okay, <laughs> forget, I'll find him. Don't I forget, worry, I'm good like Yeah, that. but if you if you search audio pen, uh, you'll find it. It's it's I think it's gonna be big. Or it'll get bought bought out and put into a more established product. I'm gonna give you a bonus, Canva. If anyone uses Canva, yes. the AI tools in Canva are phenomenal at the moment. So you can do a lot of what we're talking about, image creation, presentation creation, and writing, um AI generated writing all within Canva. Um and it's it's really top notch. So yeah, they're my favorite at the moment. Superb, Dan. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Dan. I'm gonna ask you to send me all those links. We're gonna put all those links in the show notes, um, to your blog, to your socials, to your book. Um, and people follow Dan. Like I this is how he ended up on this podcast. I followed him on LinkedIn and I love his content, loads in there. I'm not a massive um, AI nerd, but I can see myself going there. I literally can see myself going down that path. Um, we're, we're getting back out of the rabbit hole. Thank you very much. It's been brilliant. Thanks, Lisa. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.